All right. Welcome everyone to What You Need Before You Read. Uh, this is, in essence, a beginner's course for audiobook narration. Uh, my name is Jason Markiewicz, and I've been an audiobook narrator for about three years now and have 22 officially on Audible at this moment, uh, two more that are going to be out there in the next month or two and a couple more in contract at the moment. So moving right along on the audiobook narration side, but the point of this class isn't to try to tout myself as the world's greatest audiobook narrator or to say that I know everything there ever was to know about audiobook narration, but it's to do exactly what the title says. It's to give you information, a 10 to maybe 11 step model on what you can probably do to better prepare yourself for audiobook narration if it's something you are interested in pursuing in the future. But more than anything, I think most of us are looking at this as an opportunity uh, that can potentially be done alongside whatever full-time job you might have or starting it off in a part-time capacity. Um, when I do my formal introduction slide, uh, this is very much a part-time job for me. I am not a full-time narrator or voice actor, but it is something that uh, I really enjoy doing. And if I can help each of you to shorten your timeline to get to this point, then this will have been a success. Okay, well, let's see how this, uh, there we go. All right, so this is me. Um, I am a full-time Air Force person, so 24 years right now in the Air Force. And so working full-time doing that job uh, does not allow me the ability to really do much of anything else on another full-time capacity. So uh, theater and acting is something I really enjoy doing. Uh, and as many of us understood in 2020, when the theaters all closed down for COVID, some of us were looking at other opportunities to exercise our theatrical chops. And I took uh, up an audiobook narration class to try to figure out if this was something that I was interested in doing. At the same time, I started writing some audio drama scripts uh, out of works of Edgar Allan Poe and working the audio drama business as well. But it has been uh, something that over the course of three years, um, I have been able to become a lot more comfortable with. Um, Nobody is going to be super comfortable the, the first time out of the box, uh, but with more coaching and classes and experience and attempting to uh, land that first job or the second or the third, each one that you do and each one that, uh, that you're able to complete will show more and more progress toward becoming a pretty good audiobook narrator. Uh, and I've been thankful to win a few recognitions for audiobook narration over the course of the last few years. Uh, and it, uh, of course, is nice to hear that you've done good work, but in the, in the long run, um, it's about producing that work that you are proud of, and hopefully you're able to, to get to that point here uh, shortly after this course is completed. In 2022, I was able to do 11 books, and some of them are uh, short, like uh, the bottom right of the slide is essentially the poem, The Night Before Christmas, that was called A Visit from St. Nicholas. We did that as a dramatization, but a lot of the other ones, you know, being full length books, including Forbidden, that was just under 10 hours long. So uh, a variety of different book styles. Uh, we've got like Finding Home was more of a modern, uh, more edgy fiction story uh, dealing with corruption and homelessness and things like that. Uh, the Hunted, which was more of a law enforcement drama. You see the romance titles with very romance title book covers up there from uh, Liz Isaacson. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe's Telltale Heart, and so forth. So, you know, a good different uh, array of titles over the course of 2022. And um, and it was really nice to have a variety of different genres because it, it keeps you, um, it, it keeps your chops uh, ready for whatever genre you might be contracted to do. And it's, uh, it's nice to not be too rooted into one particular style. And that's led to 2023, where I've completed two and uh, currently recording an autobiography from the author that uh, I worked with a couple of years ago on a, a Western story called The Walking Why. And uh, his life is pretty incredible. And this, this autobiography really is a, um, an, an ability to see uh, from a travel perspective and uh, the journey that he had around the world to becoming a cowboy and working his own ranch. It is it's a very impressive and entertaining story. And I'm looking forward to getting that released here in a few months. And then uh, just uh, last night, in fact, contracted for the girl next door, another one from Lorraine Eckhart. So, you know, a lot of things in progress already for 2023. 
So I'd like to have each of you now uh, take a moment and very briefly uh, state your name. Why are you interested in becoming an audiobook narrator? And what is one thing that you hope to get out of this class? So I can just go down the list. Um, so let's just start with Ari. Hi, uh, my name is Aria. I, um, I'm an actor right now. Um, and I'm looking to take it in a more professional direction. Um, I've been interested in doing voiceover, which I know it's not exactly the same to do audiobook narration, but I'm kind of viewing this as a foyer into that field in general. Um, in particular, what I hope to get out of this, um, the basic resources of where to start and what I need to start getting uh, myself pitched. In, in theatrical representation, the equivalent is, you know, a demo reel and headshots, you know, um, what is the etiquette on, on what I would need material wise to start, you know, going out to aud audition. I have some equipment at home, but it's the professional materials that I, I would need and just the guidance and, and how to self research after that. Thank you. Awesome. Good. It's almost like uh, that check should be in the mail because hopefully you get exactly that uh, out, of the, <laughs> out of the next few slides. Well oh, done. Thanks. All right, uh, Wendy. I apologize, having so much trouble with the unmuting there. I'm on my phone. Um, hi, I'm Wendy Hoagland. I am a voiceover actor, uh, though my specialty has been in more corporate narration, short form. I haven't done any long form. The longest form I've done is e-learning. Um, so I am hoping to get out of this class. I'm interested in doing audiobooks. Um, I'm I'm looking for advice that editing, I think, uh, mm. uh, is a little bit intimidating to me on the long form. So that's what I'm hoping to get as well as tips or advice. I really appreciate you hosting this. Thank you. No, that's great. And the, the editing part of it, the audio editing piece, I think was where I watched most of the YouTube videos to familiarize myself with how to do it to, to a degree that even sounds professional. Um, so that, that I think was very challenging. Uh, so yeah, I, I fully agree. Great. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. All right. Uh, Sharon. Hi, I'm Sharon Grunwald. I've been doing voice acting since 2017. I got my start thanks to my daughter whose teacher said, have you ever heard about doing this stuff? Um, and I've done quite a bit of book readings for English as a second language students, but they're not up to professional grade. They're really not contracted with rights holders. It's just an immersive thing for students. So what I'm hoping to get out of this is how to bring my reading style up to par for ACX and other uh, more official audiobooks. Excellent. Yeah, definitely. It, when we kind of transition from, I like to read to now I'm reading uh, and recording it and getting that put out there. That's a different story. So yeah, very good. Thank you. Uh, Patricia. Hi, uh, Patricia. Um, in California. I um, have done some radio uh, production in the past. So I've done a, a narration for videos. Uh, not a whole lot. And then I was in a different job for a long time. So I retired recently and wanted to um, just get into some audio uh, book recording um, just to make a little extra money and um, just because it sounds kind of fun. Um, I have actually have two books that I would, friends have written that they were going to let me, you know, re read for them. And so that I don't have to necessarily audition for them but I think my stumbling block is just trying to get a good clean recording and I I don't really have a studio I have a um I'm in an apartment some noise but I like home so anyway that's kind of where I'm needing a little extra assistance of how to get that clean recording so that it it qualifies for um audible 
Yeah, excellent. Yeah, and the uh, the beauty of ACX is there is a um, there is a studio the uh, inside the ACX program, so that when you upload files, it'll tell you whether or not you've met the requirements in order to go forward, and will actually highlight that for you to to tell you that it doesn't meet it or if it does. Um, but the learning outside of ACX is important too, so that when you upload it, you're not dependent on it to give you the data. It's basically validating that it's ready versus telling you all the the issues that are out there. So yeah, I, I fully understand. It, go, it kind of goes back to what we mentioned earlier with learning how to do the audio engineering and audio editing part of, of the uh, narration game, especially when you're an individual producer. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, Nancy. Hi, uh, I'm Nancy, and I have just always enjoyed reading aloud, and I've been interested in getting into um, reading books and things, and um, I've actually written a book of poetry, and and I was thinking about maybe um, starting with that one, and uh, I just, I, I don't know where to start, so I'm just hoping that this class will give me some place to start. That's awesome. I, I am I'm grateful for you being in here because this this is the 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 best part of it is the the overwhelming aspect at the beginning. And uh, let me know at the end of this if you feel like you are in a much more um uh, uh you know you're you're a lot calmer about getting started if you've got uh, some of the questions answered and ready to go. So that's that would be where I'm trying to make sure that we get you today. Awesome. Excellent. Thank you, Nancy. When I had you guys fill out the registration, uh, there were some questions on there. I found them very interesting to look through because you see how many different genres are out there that people are interested in. Uh, when I took my first narration class, there was, um, I wouldn't say it was a survey, it was more of an informal, you know, while we were actually online with the instruction about, you know, what, what are the genres that you're most interested in doing? And after that was all said to us, one of the things that I think was a, a great piece of advice was the genres that you are most interested in, or the ones where you find yourself reading the most, you are already more comfortable in narrating in that style. It's the style you enjoy reading. It's probably going to be one of the better styles for you to start in narration because you're familiar with the way the, the flow of the book goes. You understand kind of the, the excitement pieces. You understand, you know, the characterizations and, and so forth. And so it's, it's more difficult if you start out of the gate with something where you're completely unfamiliar, uh, it's going to come across in that narration. So starting with things that you're really interested in or where you have some familiarization is a great first step. Uh, you know, unsurprisingly, a lot of responses were in fiction because the character, the, the category is so broad, everything from romance to science fiction to espionage and everything else. Nonfiction and biographies is real challenging. I was surprised actually to see so many responses in nonfiction. Um, but then you do have the children's and the young adults and the, and the uh, self-help and textbooks and so on. But this is a, a great sample because we had 10 people uh, register and you can see more than 10 responses. So that says that a lot of people are multi-genre interested. And, and that's great. And being able to um, use your narration skills to, to narrate in multiple genres uh, just opens up the market so much more for you. Uh, but I always would encourage you to start where you are most comfortable, whether that's in the style that you like to read or in the style that you are just most comfortable uh, being a part of. So why did you sign up for this class? Um, I see a lot of them are considering part-time job as an audiobook narrator, and that's awesome. Uh, that was what I would have filled out when I took the first class. Um, I just need to know a little bit more, but I also see that too down here that I'm overwhelmed. And I think that was uh, one that I would have also probably clicked on because it seemed to me that I knew very little about the microphone. I didn't know much about the, um, the voice acting business. I didn't know much about setting up a space, uh, what is and is not um, good. Uh, I, I really had a very low baseline. I didn't know a whole lot about the business. I had listened to audiobooks for years, and I jokingly, you know, refer to Scott Brick as my audiobook Jesus. You know, that's the person that I, I listened to just about anything that he would narrate. Uh, I'm a fan. 
And so I take a, a, a good amount of different styles of audiobook narration I've listened over the years, but that didn't mean that I could just jump in and do it myself. So there was still a lot of things that I needed to learn. And uh, considering it as a part-time job was number one. Background info, this is going to flow very well into one of the, the steps that I'll show you, uh, because there's, there's definitely a, a goodness involved in knowing how to be a character before you try to narrate a character. If you've been on stage, uh, whether it's theater, film, or doing voice work already, uh, you've had to create a character and perform it live or perform it on film or whatever, and you understand a little bit more about what makes that person tick. In the theater world, most directors will uh, ask you for a backstory. Like, what is it that makes this character important? What makes this character do what they do? How, how do you see this character acting or behaving or uh, pacing style? You know, what drives them to be the way they are? All of that is even valid inside the audiobook characterization because you have to not necessarily create separate voices per se, but you need to create separate people. And, and each of them have a characteristic or a style or a trait that is uniquely theirs. And so the more you know about building characters, the, the better you will be at creating those characters with your voice. So having some sort of a background that really allows you to do that is important. The reason I added the bottom two things about I like to read out loud and I like to listen to audiobooks is whenever you're trying to become something, audiobook narrator or anything else, listening to people who are professional in the business already gives you a background. You, you hear the pacing, you understand kind of how the, the diction works. What, you know, what do they do as far as creating characters and voices? And so you can, you can kind of absorb some of that from the way they do it and reading out loud. We've all probably read to our kids or read a book out loud in some capacity and you create little voices here and there. So we've, as long as we have done something like that, even if you don't have any theatrical background or anything else, you've had to create a character in some way. So you do have a small baseline already. Um, and then anything else you can do to try to enhance that just gives you that much more of a leg up. So as we start talking about the part-time job, the first question that I get asked a lot is, how much does it cost? And I know that a big concern for me, uh, and one of the things that I really set as my first year benchmark was I'm going to spend X amount of money on getting started. And then I have to have enough contracts or jobs that it ends up paying that off before I upgrade anything else or before I really determine, do I want to do this long term? Can this be self-sustaining or does it turn into a money hole that I just don't see anything out of? The challenge in audiobook narration is going to be how do you uh, select the jobs that end up paying you back quickly or do you select the jobs that are royalties based where you might get that return spread over a period of seven years, which is the contract you would get with ACX. So if you do the royalty share books, your, your royalties will grow as the number of books you have on there grow, but it may be a long time to see the return on a lot of that initial uh, revenue. If you get paid per finished hour, obviously that, that check comes to you as you complete the work. So however it is that, that you choose to do it, it's, um, it's not a right or wrong method. Um, per finished hour only is not the only thing you do. Royalty share, you know, is, is fine. There's nothing wrong with it. It's about what it is that, or how you understand how that money comes back to you. What do you want to do? And do, does the project speak to you? Um, I have up on the upper left here in the, the cover chart there, I have the Russian who saved the world. That was one that initially was looked at as what they called royalty share plus a little bit of uh, money in the beginning, and then royalties over the course of seven years. As uh, I interviewed with the publisher and talked about it, we, we settled on royalty share only. Uh, this was one that the work spoke to me, and I really wanted to do this project. And even though it wasn't necessarily one that was going to pay a heavy amount in the very beginning, it would be perfectly acceptable to put that on the long-term royalty share uh, side of the house and see how that worked over the course of seven years because the work was so good. So, you know, think about the, the quality of work and what you want to accomplish with each of the books you take. But auditioning is where it really comes down to. 
and audition when you want, work as much or as little as you want. And that's the, that's what you can do, um, you know, in, in the audiobook narration business. If you only want to take on, like I do about one book a month, um, you know, but just because of time considerations as a part-time narrator, perfectly acceptable, but audition as much as you want, or as much as you can, the more auditions you have out there, the better chance, of course, you have for being selected. And then, as I mentioned earlier, pay increases, the more books you do royalties, you know, are set at uh, what they will say 40%, but your part is 20, the author's part is 20. And the per finished hour is paid by your time. A whole lot of reading, a whole lot of performing, um, you know, to get you started. But then when you're actually in the book itself, reading is a little bit of it. You want to be competent and you want to be capable of reading, uh, but your prep should make it to where it's kind of like when we're reading a script. The better you know the script, the more you can focus on your character. The, the better you know the book, the more you can focus on the story and less about trying to track the line. So audiobook narration is not just reading the book. Uh, so I put these pictures of some theatrical performances I've been in to say, um, building that character and really understanding that character is a lot of what you will do when you're creating that character in audio format. And so when you're doing this as, as part of a larger project, you might be revisiting these characters over and over again, but it could be four, five, six chapters uh, before that character comes back. So the more you understand about what that character is or who that character is, you can re-attack that later uh, because you understand how to build it in the first place. All right, so I'm going to start now. Uh, actually, let's do this. Any questions over the first series of things I talked about before we move into what I would consider to be my 10 steps to getting ready to submit an audition? Do we have anything that's popped up to this point? Okay, nothing heard. So step one, listen to audio productions. Uh, I put as here kind of a subtitle to that, that uh, main title is be a student of the industry. Listen to a variety of things, whether it's audio books, audio dramas. Um, the more that you have as, as a library in your mind of different styles of narration, different styles of audio acting or voice acting, um, you start to build your own repertoire and you can think about not just how the characters are developed, but as I was told during my first narration class, don't forget the narrator is also a character and you want to make sure that that narrator is the, the thread that binds the story together. You still need to be a character. So listen to various different styles of audio productions, whether they're books or dramas to really get an understanding of, of how the narrator is telling that story. And if you haven't already, practice reading aloud. I don't know about you guys, but I can read pretty quickly. And as I take that to reading aloud, I have to really focus on my pacing. And so reading aloud is different, even if you're just reading aloud to someone else right next to you, uh, versus when you're reading for the purpose of audiobook narration. You want to make sure that your pacing is right because you have to give the listener an ability to follow along with what you're saying. And if your pacing is really quick, uh, they're going to have a hard time catching up with what you already said before you've moved on to something else. So you, you really would need to practice reading aloud. Uh, and I found it very challenging. As you see the story that I have up here, The Mask of the Red Death, one of my favorites from Edgar Allan Poe, just reading through something like that, uh, which is not a long story, but reading it from beginning to end, you learn two things. You learn where you have a hard time with, uh, with just carrying on um, the, the length of reading that would be required, meaning can you go from start to finish? How long until you need a break? How long until you need to get a drink of water? How long until you, your voice starts to tire? And each of these things you learn because you've practiced reading aloud. And you'll mark down where it is that you've identified some of the, the problems with long form reading. Um, and we all do get tired. The voice does change and it sounds different. Your voice can sound tired after a while. So when you're listening to 
audiobook narrators, um, you know, after you've bought the CD or downloaded it from Audible or whatever, you know, we hear an 11 hour audiobook. How long does it take them to get the 11 hours? How many times do they stop? How many errors do they make? How many? We don't know because what you hear is the finished product. So, so what you need to do with reading aloud is take it from beginning to end and find out where those difficulties lie for you and try to find out, do you need to um, practice more before you take on a long project like this? Does your voice recover quickly enough after day one in order to record again on day two? Or is this going to be something that you need a little bit more um, a, more practice in order to, um, to develop the skill set or the longevity in order to be able to get through something that could be 300 pages long? And then how do you maintain the vocal strength to be able to do that? So just starting with something that's only a few pages long, practice reading aloud, uh, and try to get that understanding so that you're ready when that time comes. Any questions on this? Okay, nothing heard. Taking a class is worth it. Uh, this was a class I took with uh, Ray Nakamoto uh, there in Sacramento. If anybody is uh, members of SARTA, you see on the, the uh, monthly letter, uh, he has a lot of classes that are out there and available for audiobook narration and voiceover work and commercial acting and so forth. Um, and uh, taking any sort of, of classes will give you an understanding and give you an ability to uh, practice uh, and to refine the skills you would need to hopefully continue to get better in whatever your focus is for that course. There are individual classes about narration just in general. There are classes about uh, ACX in general. The uh, classes about voiceover in general, commercial voiceover versus audiobook narration. So you you can specialize in whatever uh, the 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 class is that you want to take. But one thing's for certain is you will learn a little bit just by doing. And the more audiobooks you narrate, the better you're going to get. the The more times you do audio engineering, the better you will get at that. But there is something to be said for coaching. And uh, getting uh, to a degree where you're comfortable and then find out how you can move it to the next level. And that, that'll be the, the challenge to everybody is continue to progress, continue to learn and challenge yourself with becoming better at your craft and making sure that you take the time uh, to invest in yourself while you're also uh, creating great works that people want to hear. Step four, pick up tools of the trade. All right, now this is where we're gonna do um, a little bit of a bonus step right after this is I'll show you uh, what my first setup was. Um, but what do you need just to get started? I've, I've heard, and some of you had already talked about it in the beginning about, well, I don't have a booth at the house. I don't have a professional sound booth. Uh, you'll find that some people go and rent spaces in studios. Uh, some, uh, if you look them up on YouTube, you will see people who are using the clothes in their master closet as the, the sound dampening system. And the microphone is kind of on a stand shoved in the middle of, of a group of clothes. And that helps to, to, uh, keep the sound dampening around master closets are great because they're usually internal walls to the house. You don't necessarily have an external wall to the master closet in, in most cases. So those are something that you can think about doing. But what do you really need uh, to think about is the quality of the sound, not necessarily the quality of the equipment as you get started. And I will, I will caveat that with a small asterisk. I don't want anyone to think that I just said, use a Bluetooth mic or use your phone, because that's not true. You want to make sure that you have some sort of a, of, of a quality microphone. Um, you know, a USB microphone is a good way to get started. Uh, I would not encourage that for as you, you progress in the trade and start moving through, but I don't want anyone to go out there and think they need to start with a $1,500 microphone in order to get the first project done. My first microphone, uh, I, I forget exactly it's on the next slide, but it was somewhere around 75 or, or $80, somewhere right in there. It was a USB microphone made by Mayono. It's the picture here on the upper left of this slide. And it was a, a kit. So it had the microphone, the shock mount. Um, it had the, 
um, the, the pop filter, it came with a stand. I mean, it was pretty much everything that, that was needed in that, that mic setup. It was, you know, a, a really, a good quality starter mic. Um, and since then I've upgraded, you know, to where now I use a road NT one, but this is a great way to get started and it won't break the bank. Think about your space. Think about headphones. Uh, think about, um, you know, I used an old music stand for what you see on there with uh, the tablet that's right next to my note page on there as well. So the tablet I use to actually read the books uh, so that you don't hear flipping pages. It's just scrolling on a tablet. And then the paper that's right next to it are my character notes and sometimes the pickups that need to get done as I re-listen and I find where I either said uh, the wrong word or transposed a couple of words and I need to go back and re-record a few things. I'll make notes and go back and do that. But I also create characterization notes like that and keep it next to me so that if I need to revisit a character that I've got a shorthand uh, that I can go back and take a look at what that character was like earlier in the story. For longer works, uh, I've also gone through and made small audio files where I say some lines in that character's voice or I create, um, you know, a, a small um monologue in that character's personality so that I can go back and revisit that later. And uh, was this person a high pitched or a gruff voice, you know, and, and what was their mannerism like and so forth. But that's a, that's kind of an aside here. We're talking tools. And so that's, that's where you're going to be starting up. So think about quality of sound, not necessarily top of the line equipment to get you going. So what does that mean? Well, I said you could do it for about $500 and truth in lending, uh, I guess I broke my budget by $10.75. So what was it that I did for $510.75? My first studio was a blanket fort. In fact, it's the one that you see right behind me right now as I'm currently here in Virginia and not at my house in California where I have a, a professional booth now. My blanket fort is here with me as, as I'm across country. But the sound blankets from Vocal Booth to Go, no, that's not a, a, a paid advertisement for Vocal Booth to Go. This is just telling you what I did, the companies that I went through, uh, through my research, uh, ran me about 250 bucks for the sound blankets. Microphone stand, pop filter, headphones, all that stuff was 114. Uh, the audio booth PVC frame, uh, including the light bar that you see on the upper right, as well as some spare parts, which I, I throw that in there, the, the hooks that you see up there as well that... I use for the grommeted sound blankets to hook them to the top of the PVC frame and the microphone itself at about $75. So that was the startup right there. Uh, if you wanted to pick up a tablet and you don't have one, you'll have to add that to the list, but you can do it, um, you know, off your computer. Uh, they'll, when you're in ACX, the file for the script will be sent to you by usually a PDF. Sometimes it's a word document, but either way you'll get it digitally. And so you can, certainly use your computer. Uh, some people have even, they've got the larger phones that have the larger screens and sometimes they go off that. Uh, I find it very difficult to read off my phone. So, you know, using a tablet is a little bit easier. And the thing that you really gain by doing that is you don't hear page flipping and, um, and you'll need to get rid of those anyway. And that's part of the audio editing and the proofing process, but uh, being able to do this digitally is, is good. So this is the the first home studio. Um, what questions right now may have have been brought up with just looking at the first home studio piece? Anything that has uh, crossed your mind at this point? Um, so I have a USB mic. Is that yes? Um, I don't know if that can be converted to a, um, whatever the other kind is called. The XLR? Yeah, XLR. Um, not, not usually. Um, I, I think, I don't remember if, uh, if there's a, a couple of mics that have both inputs or not, but I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't try to necessarily convert. You know, the, the best thing would be to, if you're using a USB mic right now, that's, that's great to get started. It's really about the quality of that mic uh, mm -hmm. and whether it can produce the sound that, it, that you're looking for. Uh, if it uh, picks up a great deal of background noise and really requires you to uh, noise reduce while you're engineering, um, may maybe the mic is not quite right, or maybe it's your space. Maybe the space is just too noisy, and we've got to work on 
you know, the sound dampening of the area around it. Uh, I know that USB mics can be a challenge because there'll be some very attractive, they look really nice, and then you plug them in and it sounds very tinny. So, mm -hmm. so it's just really, um, you know, you try them out. Uh, and I thought that was really weird when I heard that the first time. Well, you might need to buy two or three different kinds of mics, try them out, see which one works better for your voice and, and so forth. And I was thinking, why would I do that? You know, I would kind of find one that I think was recommended and I'll do that. But there's some logic in it. And one of the reasons that I have kept each of my previous mics is they all do something just a little bit different. In fact, the, the, the Shure that I'm using right now while we're on this, this talk is a dynamic mic and it's better for podcasting and for audio dramas and for doing things like this because it doesn't let in a lot of background noise. And as you can see, I'm not in my booth right now. I'm, I'm out in the middle of a room. So I don't want a lot of the extraneous background noise to come in. And these are good for that. The problem um, that you find with, with the uh, dynamic mics though, is that sometimes you, you lose some words if you're not uh, speaking loud enough into the mic. The minute you really turn off access, it can go away and maybe it doesn't pick it up. And so you'll lose that on, on the, the recording where the condenser mics will pick up a little bit more because the mic is hot. And so you're, you're going to maybe pick up some background and things. So it really does require you to, to make sure your space is quieter, but it, it is important to try some mics out. Um, you know, I've, I've kept all the ones I've had to this point and, um, and it's good to be able to, to test back and forth uh, what you wanted to, what kind of a sound do you want to get? Um, so the USB mic will work, you know, certainly to get going. Okay. I yeah, Aria, question. go ahead. Sure. Um, I don't know if um, in your startup process, you might remember what the difference might have been between, let's say, a master closet and a sound blanket. Um, well, I'm, I'm seeing the P, uh, the uh, PVC frame looks window size. So it seems kind of small. I, I would be wondering if I, if I had a place where I don't have a lot of free space to set up a booth, but I did have a closet, mm -hmm. would, it, would it be enough with enough, you know, blanketing and of course processing and audacity afterwards for white noise that it could still be submittable or um i i would i would say yes because really i no one is going to go back i mean until they ask you well what is your studio like and you have to actually come up voice about you know what your your studio looks like it's about the sound quality and mm -hmm. so you know the like a I have seen and one of the videos that that I watched in the very beginning recommended starting in a closet because people would want to go out and you know buy a five thousand dollar audio booth and set it up in their house and they're like you don't need to do that you know it, maybe eventually you want to get to that point and a lot of the super pro narrators they have you know very quiet spaces almost like you know audiology booths you know to the sound level you know sound quality level in their house. But just to get started, do you want to really want to start at that point? And so one of the recommended things was you just find some place that can be quiet. And, and one of the first stops on that chart was about the master closet, um, you know, being an internal room that theoretically would not have an outside wall, you know, right next to it. So you probably reduce the guy next door's mowing the lawn or, or you've got kids playing, you know, right outside the room that, that make it challenging because it, it creeps into the microphone and so forth. Mm -hmm. So no, I, I don't think that there's a, a problem with starting there. What you have to worry about in master closets because of the lower ceiling space sometimes is if the microphone's not positioned well, if you get added echo. So you've got to, to, to kind of think about the way that the acoustics work inside so if, if you have um, clothes that are hung higher toward the, the, the ceiling part of it, you're probably going to be better off than if it's, it's um, more shelving to the top just because of the way the sound bounces. So just you have to test it, you know, where's the mic placement and, and so forth. Um, there's there's a, a good design, like when, when I put my mic here in this booth, uh, just being a blanket fort, I still have to deal with some sound bounce, even on the inside of the, the blanket fort. So you try to figure out where the mic needs to be placed to try to reduce echo. You'd have to do the exact same thing in a closet. And, and that really turns into testing a few times, read, you know, maybe for three, four minutes or so, and then go back and listen and see where you're like, woo, that echoed out, especially as I got into character and that, that got exciting. All of a sudden you're getting an echo because your voice got a little bit louder and then you're starting to, to bounce off the walls. 
So just starting to, okay. to think about what, what do you need to do to try to sound dampen that space? But, you know, long answer to a short question, right? Uh, you you got to do some testing to find out what works. Thank you. Any other questions before we move forward? All right, awesome. So to Ari's point, here we are. Find or build a quiet space would be step five. Nothing ruins a recording like a noisy background. So whether you've got a blanket fort or you've got a, uh, a master closet, uh, this is actually during a recording of the Raven that uh, my buddy Brennan and I did. Uh, there it was right there. I did not have a booth set up at this point. We were uh, attempting to try to do the first work. This was the first audio drama that, that uh, I produced and um, looking to try to dampen that sound. The, the little wrap that goes around the microphone, I picked up individually and it attaches to the mic stand. And then uh, everything else was just kind of brought into there and sound dampened with the, the clothes as kind of the dampening system. So it really does work out well. And, and you just have to test it and see. Ari, to answer kind of your question, you see it's kind of shoved in a corner. And so what it, with all of that dampening behind it, it really helps in sound getting out, you know, past the back of the mic. Um, but then also I put that towel on top because it's open. And so what I did find as we were doing an earlier recording is any of the sound that would be angled upward was actually going over the top of it and it was hitting the side of the closet and bouncing around and I could hear the echo. So putting that towel over the top as just a little bit of a barrier worked wonders in trying to keep that bounce down. Select a DAW. This is your uh, digital audio workspace. And I put in there in parentheses, Audacity is free. So uh, some of the other um, programs out there like uh, Reaper and uh, Adobe Audition and things like that, you'll hear you know, a lot of people uh, tout the praises of any of those three. Uh, I've used Audacity for every book I've done, including all the audio dramas. Um, it's a free program, but it's not bad because it's free. It's actually a pretty decent program. And I have a lot of people um, that are you know, much further along in the audiobook narration business than I am that still use Audacity as their primary program. So by no means is this a starter program that uh, you'll use for a while and then upgrade somewhere else. You certainly can, but it's not necessary. It'll do what you need it to do. The nice thing about Audacity, though, is I find it to be fairly user-friendly. I think that might be debatable in some circles where people are, are challenged with uh, the way some of the upgrades and updates to Audacity uh, have changed what they were used to, but that's like anything else that changes. You know, you got to figure it out when the new update happens and, you know, where the controls went and sometimes things change and so forth. But I have found no issues with Audacity. Um, I have um, never lost a file with Audacity. I haven't had any corrupted files with Audacity. Uh, I've been able to reduce the sound. I've been able to work with the gain on my interface um, and use it to, um, to create every work I've done so far. So I think just because it's free, don't think that means that it's bad. Uh, you certainly can do a lot with it, and, and it's a great way to get started. So were there any uh, questions on this before we move past? Okay, I got something come up in the chat. Oh, and the ACX check plugin is, oh, that is a fa fantastic point. Yes. So we were talking about um, audio engineering. And I think if I remember right, Nancy, I think you were talking about the audio engineering side about being uh, overwhelming and, and a little bit challenging on that part. There is a, a plugin from Nyquist that you can load into Audacity that is actually called ACX Check. And when you finish with your audio engineering, you can get everything to the point that you think it is. Then you just run that, that plugin and it will tell you whether or not it meets the criteria for ACX. And once you pass that, you have a, a very high likelihood, I won't say perfect, but a high likelihood of passing the ACX check when you load it up into the system. The reason I say that it's not 100% is if, uh, if you're in so close to the margins, even though it passes on ACX check, it might modify just a touch when you put it into ACX. So, so the the, the best plan is to be somewhere 
not close to the margin on the 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 loudness, the volume, the 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 upper level of the of the DB. So if, if you kind of work yourself into giving your your ability to have a little bit of room on the the margins, then you're you're almost assured when you put it into ACX. But yeah, that plugin is amazing. Great point. <clears throat> Okay. And let's see, here we go. Okay. Step seven, practice reading and recording. This, this was important to me to put in. And when I, I kind of teased this class out at a library uh, about a month ago, um, I had that practice reading right, bef right before, I believe, or maybe a slide or two before this, but the, the phases or the steps that they're put in here, uh, I wanted to make it more chronological. So let's let's start with you know the practice reading at the beginning, building your space, getting your equipment, and now we're into reading and recording. Um, I wrote this as kind of a subtitle to this. It'll shock you to hear your own voice. Boy, is that true. So not necessarily needing a show of hands, but I'm sure that there is someone out there that does not like the sound of their voice. I know I don't like the sound of my voice. It comes across okay, I guess, on audiobooks and people buy them. So there you go. But I'm still coming to grips with the fact that I sound like that. How about that? When it comes across on the, as you're listening to it, uh, the first time that you hear your voice being read back to you as you're audio editing, it, it can be challenging for you. Um, I, I thought frequently uh, too much, I think, at the beginning about, um, I don't like how, how uh, this sounds. I need to add more bass to my voice. I need to... Uh, try to change it using plugins or something like that. And the, I would say that the um, advice from a highly experienced and professional narrators is don't go around trying to add um, filters to your voice. Just professionally use your voice. Your voice is your voice. And if you manipulate it, that's not that's not necessary. If you're using a filter or you're, you're adding bass or you're doing whatever, uh, that, can, that can take away from your characterization. It can, it can muddy the, the overall sound of the production if you're trying to add something to it that isn't natural. There are microphones that are suited for bringing out more, more of the resonance. There are microphones that are better for women with high-pitched voices. There are microphones better for males with super deep, low voices. I have more of a, of a mid-range voice, so I, I kind of get away with whatever microphones are out there, but I know that one of the reasons I selected the Rode NT1 was it does have a capability of picking up more of the lower resonance. And that was something that I wanted to, to try to add in just for... A, a much more rounded sound, so it it wasn't um, it wasn't coming off you know too too plainly center. I, I really wanted to have some of that that resonance be picked up, especially as I'm voicing some of these you know Western characters and villains and things like that. I, I needed to be able to have some 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 extra gravitas come through on some of the voices that I was using, and then I wanted my normal narrator um, voice realistically to to be clear and to be pleasant to listen to, which I still have a hard time saying that it's pleasant to listen to, but I think everybody would find, you know, that when you're self-critiquing, uh, we are our worst. So uh, get past all that and try to find um, the ability for you to understand that you sound the way you sound. And now it's important to bring that through in a confident and comfortable way into the narration. Don't try to manipulate the voice, try to professionalize the narration. And that's going to help a lot. With practice reading and recording, uh, this is where you find that even the way you enunciate some things, the way that you sometimes slide across two or three words that can all blend together as a single word sometimes when we're in conversational speech, doesn't do well when you're narrating books because you're going to lose the words that might be important to carry that phrase along. So practice reading and recording and then listen back to it because while you're reading it and you're, you're narrating it into a microphone, it might sound absolutely fluent to you. Everything is great. And then you listen to it again and you're like, why am I talking so fast? And, and it's, it's really a thing. 
And so when you go back and listen, not necessarily in a point of, of, you know, tearing yourself apart, but it's a great way to critique, am I or am I not at a pace that a listener would be able to follow? Because when you've got the text in front of you, it makes sense. Now take the text away and just listen and see if you can follow along with the story, with the characters. You can tell who is who, who's saying what, uh, are your sentences separated by enough to where someone would know it's a different person talking, it's a different phrase coming up, or even a different section where sometimes you'll notice in books, they'll have a few line spaces, you'll see some asterisks, you move to a another couple of spaces, and you start almost a different scene inside the same chapter. Did you give enough a pause in order to make that scene change realistic? And did it happen? So practice reading and recording so that you can go back and listen to how it is that you actually uh, did that narration and where would you need to try to, to um, change what you would do as you're narrating in order to make it clearer for the listener. I didn't realize how useful YouTube was until I tried to figure out the ins and outs of audiobook narration. And uh, Scott Brick has a bunch of, of uh, videos that are out there, whether he's a, a guest on a podcast or whether it's a, um, an actual training class that he's providing, or if it's just like you see audiobook or ACX University is on there about an audiobook performance masterclass, tons of, of videos out there to be able to help you understand some of the nuances of audiobook narration. But we just talked a little bit about Audacity. And Audacity can do a lot of different things. Um, it, it, they don't always have defaults inside each of the, the little effects or the tools that you might wanna use. So you've gotta learn what those, those things mean and how to make it work for your particular voice tone and, and so forth. And so these tutorials are out there as well on YouTube and you can listen and watch them as they go through and narrate a piece, audio edit it, uh, everything that you would kind of need to be able to get started. And I put these two up there specifically because they're ones that I watched. And so I figure, well, if I'm going to tell you about what I did, I may as well show you the videos I listened to and, and watched. And these Audacity tutorials and the beginner tutorial that uh, does a very good job about kind of walking through, um, you know, what you need when you use Audacity. I think one of the, the, uh, the, the, uh, trying to think of the right word here. One of the things that narrators will want to do is how do I get rid of this background noise? And so I'm going to put a noise gate up. And, and I hear that terminology a lot. I was even guilty of it. In the first couple of books that I narrated, I used a noise gate uh, that was at a, a specific sound level in order to basically cut out any noise that was from that level and below. And that would hopefully uh, take out what I was hearing as background noise. The problem that you find with that is as you put the gate on and then you go in and you listen is that depending on where you set that, you might cut off some of the things that you said. And so even the narrated pieces will be cut because our voices tend to get softer as we end a sentence. We don't talk like a newscaster out there and, and end everything with, with a raised tone. And we don't always send it back to the studio. And so sometimes you trail off at the end. And if you do that and you have the gate there, it's gone. So using some of the noise reduction uh, in a very light sense uh, is much better than noise gating. So just as a, as a tip, just think about noise reduction versus noise gating. And, and I, I say that, use it lightly for the reason that um, even using noise reduction can be a challenge and it can make your voice sound muddy or it can make the, the overall narration uh, sound different if you use it uh, too heavily. So, so just be cautious on how much you use software to reduce noise versus making your space less noisy. That's going to be better for you is just to get your space quieter instead of trying to use software to make that difference. Any questions on the, the YouTube side? Yes, Patricia, go ahead. Um, I just had a question about um, using a I guess it would be a plugin or something for mm -hmm. um, reducing like the problem I was having when I was testing my system was um, more like uh, reverb. I mean, there wasn't background noise, but there was sort of a echoey, slightly right. echoey. Sound. 
and I thought there was something that you could use in Audacity to um, eliminate that. Um, you you can um, it and you know it's one of those where I also you know I, I found that in some of the the earlier books that I narrated was that kind of reverb that goes in there. And, and instead of trying to manipulate it, um, I learned it sometimes about microphone placement, where it is in your space to try to reduce the reverb that you're getting, because it, it may not be fully echoed, but I know what you're saying about having that, that echo be present. It's also about if you get too close to the microphone, sometimes the, the, the actual mic rattles. And so you get some, uh, unwanted uh, extra noise just based on the mic itself. So just thinking about pacing, they always say, you know, kind of be the, the hang loose, you know, sign away from the microphone, you know, with the, the uh, thumb and, and pinky right. finger kind of being away from the mic about that distance, you know, it kind of gives you a, a good spacing when you're, you're trying to do, um, do narration, but it also helps you stay consistent in where you are against the microphone, which is important. Um, as far as reducing the the reverb, um, I'll just be honest and tell you, I haven't tried to software reverb out. Uh, I've just re-recorded the sections that I noticed that was there because it was very different from the rest of the chapter. And so I went back and just re-recorded a section or, or two and sometimes a paragraph or two that I noticed was a problem. And then I worked on mic placement and quieting down the, the booth area. Um, the difficulty and sometimes is if you're out in the open uh, recording in a room like a, a den or or a bedroom where you're out of a of a of a quiet space you're going to probably have a higher likelihood of getting that reverb than if you were inside a quieter space so i would uh, kind of advise that way instead of trying to software stuff out okay thanks any other questions before we move to the next one All right, feel free to jump in and stop me if, uh, if you think of one along the way. Okay, step nine, you're almost there, right? So time to narrate a practice story. This is where you do the whole thing beginning to end. Doesn't need to be a long one, just something that's maybe 10 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes, pick, pick something that you like. Maybe it's just one chapter per se, but do the whole thing from researching your character to making your notes, uh, read it, edit it, proof it, check for word perfect, uh, find the errors that you made, go back and splice those in, audio master it, get it to pass the ACX check, and uh, then listen to it in a final product and see how long it takes you to do that for a 10 or 15 minute production. What does it take you just to get that? And then that gives you an idea about how long it would take you to do a full book. If you really want to do something, um, you know, as a full book, find a short story that might be, you know, 20 or 30 pages long and, and do that. And then you not only will crest that hour and you try to, to figure out how long it takes you to get one finished hour, which is important if you're trying to negotiate with a rights holder about how long it will take you in order to get this book done. But it also will tell you, what is your stamina like? How long does it take you to find the time to edit out those errors? How many errors did you have? Do you need to redo a hundred things over the course of an hour? Or did you do well enough in the beginning in order to get it to where it was fairly clean and you only have a couple of things to take care of? Can you only re-record a sentence? Or is this in the middle of a longer monologue that you need to go back and re-record an entire paragraph, which might take you a much longer time than just putting in a word or, or, a, or a sentence? Uh, as we're talking about that, I would just uh, my personal technique, which, you know, this whole thing is just my personal technique, is that I never just record a word. And I don't ever try to just splice in a word. Uh, I will either re-record the entire line, uh, and I have no issue with going back to where I feel like a logical transition is there, and then re-recording from that section to the next logical transition. And maybe it's one word I messed up, but I might re-record four or five sentences or a paragraph or sometimes a conversation in order to make sure that that works. Because that one word, I don't know if I can get it in the exact same style that it was supposed to be if I'm only doing that one word or that one line. So sometimes I have to get into the characters and get involved and get animated, and then I can get that 
the right way. In order to do that, it might require extra time on the beginning and the end of that section in order to make it right. <clears throat> so those are just things that, that you'll think about when you're doing your own proofing and mastering and how you make sure that the quality is right. So questions here. All right, I love that I'm explaining all this stuff so well, this is amazing. Okay, so now one of the things that I wanted to make sure to do in this um, class versus uh, any of the previous ones is add some of these bonus steps in. So the first one we talked about was the, uh, what the studio looked like and what your initial equipment set would look like. This one, I wanted to provide a little bit of an intro to ACX. <clears throat> For anybody who has not ever used ACX before, I will tell you that it is not by any means difficult to navigate. Uh, sometimes there are challenges, um, you know, just like any other web program, you have a ton of people using it. You've got a lot of narrators, you've got a ton of authors, a lot of rights holders, you've got transactions and auditions and everything else going through this system. And sometimes it can get bogged down. Their customer service uh, works okay. Um, I've, I've never had any issues with customer service with ACX, um, you know, so I know that, that, uh, the website probably does need to upgrade a little bit. I don't know, you know, what the plan is on any future iterations, but I will tell you for my purposes as a part-time narrator, I don't have any significant issues with ACX. And when you go through and build your profile and update it and update your samples and everything else, I just, I haven't had any issues. There'll be times like every large uh, program and large computer um, you know, software suite that it will go through upgrades and it will have downtime and things like that. And, and it's a pain in the butt, just like anything else when it goes down and you're trying to get something accomplished, but uh, take a deep breath. You know, there's, there's something going on with the, the system or, or with the, the company itself or, or whatever, and it'll, it will resolve and it just might take some time, but the customer service has always gotten back to me. So I don't have any significant gripes about it, but I'm going to walk you through uh, what it would take to get you started on ACX. So first is you're going to go to acx.com and there's the website. So fairly simple. Once you get in there, you have about ACX, which is up on the upper left and you'll see the, the nice little orange arrow that's heading that direction. Once you click on about ACX, then click on what is ACX. And when you do that, you go here. Audiobook narrators on ACX are called producers and authors are rights holders. So knowing the terminology is important because if you ever have to call in uh, or, or work in one way or another with contracts and things, just know you are a producer. So why is it that we're a producer instead of just a narrator? Because you see on the left under how it works, it says authors, authors as narrators, narrators, print publishers, agents, and studio professionals. Nothing there says producer. So why is it that we're considered producers? Because of all the stuff we just talked about in the previous steps. You are the narrator, you're the proofer, you're the editor, you're the engineer, you're the, you're the um, you know, masterer of all this stuff, and then you're the uploader and you get it all in the system. Does that mean you have to do all those things? No, you can contract out. You can pay someone else to do the large majority of it if you want to. Um, people will be out there for $75 to $100 an hour that will take your, your narrated work and they will edit, master, proof, the whole thing, send you a list of things you need to fix and all that stuff. You'll end up paying for it. No, no one's going to do it for free. So if that's what you want to do, um, that's up to you. At this point, I do it all myself. Uh, I've just started looking into uh, potentially for the future, what it would take, um, you know, people that I'm comfortable with sending files out to, to have people do it and pay them for it. But um, right now, uh, still currently, I do it all myself. So it is a, a production company that is all you. So you are a producer. ACX will have you build your profile, but the profile will be considered narrators, but just understand that you are a producer. In order to start building your profile, though, you will click on the narrator's link that's on your left under how it works, and it'll take you here. And the, the little chart that's showed there, uh, get noticed, get together, get it done, get paid, that's, that's a, a, a small step uh, in this whole thing, which I'm hoping the, 
nine steps before we get to this point, uh, you're ready to start moving along in this process. But you can get your profile built and get everything you want up there before you audition. Uh, you don't, just because you have a profile doesn't mean you have to go audition. It's just the first step. You've got to have a profile to do anything else. So as you scroll down from that, that little four-part chart, it gives you 10 steps to get started, creating your profile. Uh, and each of these things that are in blue are a hyperlink. So you can click to sign up on ACX. If you already have an Amazon account, since it's handled by Amazon, you can log in with the exact same account that you have for Amazon. You don't need to build anything separate. Then they create a profile link, get you started. From there, then you upload samples. So you're like, wow, I just built a profile and now I've got to start putting samples on. So what can we do for samples? Pretty much anything because your samples, you're not selling. So if you're thinking I can only do public domain works, you can do public domain works, but that's not all you can do. You can use any work from any book, current or past uh, for your sample. Uh, it's recommended that it's no more than five minutes in length. Uh, I try to keep mine between probably three and four minutes. You'll hear um, some people recommend that you do multiple styles as kind of like we would an actor's reel where you've got different um, video clips all put together to create a reel. Um, I have one of those, um, but mostly the samples are genre specific. So all my samples that are on ACX right now, I think save one are specific to a book and it's a section out of a book that will show, uh, and I try to get one that shows multiple characters, that shows some long form narration that also uh, has some excitement or some plot involved in it as well to kind of give any rights holder a, a good understanding about what I can do in those styles. <clears throat> so I have a Western one, I've got a romance one, I've got the audio drama one is the kind of clumped together version of multiple audio dramas to show different characters and things in the dramatizations but each of the book ones are specific. Uh, tried to get ones that if you speak a different language, have one on there. If you um, can speak in different accents, have something that showcases the accents. So you can put multiple samples out there, but you wanna have each of your samples has to be what they would consider um, you know, retail ready. You don't wanna put a sample up there that sounds like you recorded it real quick on your iPhone, pushed you know, record, did, did a real quick you know, two minute, sample on a, on your phone and then download it because I've been offered uh, I've been offered jobs just on the sample, not anything I recorded on, you know, at, or auditioned for. So people will go through and listen to samples. And so you want to make sure that it's as good as you want it to be so that when any of the rights holders are just reviewing through whatever selection process they're using and they come across yours, that it gives them a good understanding about what you can do not just, oh, I just need to throw something up there. So let's put this, make sure that it's, it's something that you'd be proud to have out there that you would basically be auditioning without auditioning. So make sure that your sample is ready to showcase your effort. <clears throat> so once you have those recorded and uh, uploaded, then it'll take you to the next step in your profile, which is how do you want to get paid? There are three different options. It's royalty share, royalty share plus, or per finished hour. Um, you can select uh, the per finished hour side or the royalties uh, or royalty share plus or everything together. So you can really tell, tell the community of rights holders out there all the different ways you're willing to get paid because that does affect um, you know, who they select as they kind of narrow their search down for the narrators they might be looking for. Then audition. Start uh, looking for books that, that you're interested in doing and put your audition out there. And yes, that's actually step four. So pretty much everything to, to this point is getting you ready to go out there and do that first audition um, for the rights holder. Um, you'll want to make sure that, that you've got the ability to audio engineer to the point that the finished work would be because the audition can matter. They might get you know two or three auditions for a book. They might get hundreds of them. So how do you stand out immediately? How do you let yours be known that, that you're, you're ready to go as a narrator? So the audition does matter. One thing I will add to this is you may or may not get told that you got the job for months. Uh, you may not get told that you didn't get it. Um, so don't 
audition once, wait for that to finish the process before auditioning again. If you're interested in booking work, just audition often. Find books that you like and audition. And as I say, audition and forget it. You know, put it out there, let, uh, let the audition stand alone and move to the next audition that you're interested in doing. If multiple rights holders get back to you and they want to contract you for their books, then you can have the negotiation with them about time frame and when you can, can get the final work produced. But don't wait for one to finish before you audition for the next one if your goal is to continue to work in, in books. So make sure that, that you are, are thinking about that when you do the auditions. As contracts come up, uh, they will offer you um, a, a particular kind of payment uh, as well as a timeline. Until you push accept on the offer, everything is still up for negotiation. So there are times that a rights holder might say, I really want this done by, like in this case, let's say you booked uh, or you got selected today and they say, I want the book March 4th. And you, you take a look and you're like, okay, March 4th, well, that's a different month. And then you realize, wait, that's Saturday. And, and you start thinking about uh, how, how long does it take me to get one hour produced? Well, in the beginning, I think it took me about six hours and sometimes six and a half uh, of of recording, editing, and mastering to get one finished hour when I started. But it's not like I've reduced that a, a significant amount. I'm still about four hours to one. So it's nice I cut a third off the, the chart, but at the same time, four hours to one makes a difference when you're talking about longer projects that might be nine, 10, 11 hours long. You've got to be able to say, can I spend 45 hours doing a 10 hour project or 60 hours for a 10 hour project in the beginning and do that by Saturday. So think about how your ability to knock out one finished hour works, which is why I put step seven, record and edit and get a finished product because you, you do need to know what your capabilities are in order to produce that one hour so that if the book is three, four, five, or 10, 11, 12 hours long, you can do that math in your head that says the high likelihood is It'll take me this amount of time to get this amount of finished product. Can I do that in the time frame you need? Then you can have that negotiation with the rights holder. Sometimes they're amenable to it. Sometimes they're not. But most of the time, their target is what they would like to have, and the negotiations are, are usually available. You can also talk about how you want to get paid. My, my personal... Um, um, personal style and technique, and I've heard it uh, resonated a lot through the narrator community, is, is you need to get, if you're being paid by the finished hour, make sure that you're getting a partial payment after the first 15 minutes is approved. And then that tells the rights holder, you accepted me for the job, and I've produced this, and now you're, you're paying me this amount, which is usually you know, 40 to 50% of the overall um, cost of the production. And then for the remainder of it, the next payment is due when it's all done. And so they're invested in you, you're invested in the project, everybody's good, contract can move forward. Um, the first 15 minutes is also important because that's the time frame for the rights holder to tell you your pace is too fast. I really don't like how you're voicing this character. I'm not quite sure if you've really tracked on the, the excitement that, that, that chapter one really showed. I don't know, you know, and so they can really get involved in that first 15 minutes. Theoretically, after that first 15 minutes is done, their ability to inject a lot into your performance is over. And then you, you continue on with the remainder of the project after that checkpoint is done. So yes, and, and I said first 15 minutes, the project might be nine hours long, but in that first 15 minutes, that's their time frame to really make a lot of adjustments and so forth into the narration. I have tried to resolve a lot of issues that may transpire by having good communication with the rights holder in the beginning. Are there any places, names, any issues later on in the book that I need to know about right now? Anything that could be mispronounced that's completely unique to this, this book that I need to know now? <clears throat> Do you have a, a list of characters and their traits and things that you really are, are interested in having me do? You know, and just have that that dialogue with the rights holder early so that you can really get a good hack on that. When I did the Russian who saved the world, I got an entire pronunciation chart about how 
how to pronounce each of the Soviet submarine officers' names, how to pronounce the the cities that were um, that were being referenced, and then characterizations and demeanor and you know building you know the the depth of the character that was on me to do. But things that the author really wanted to to have out of that project supplied the list. Same thing with the book I'm just starting now, Naked Shorts. That one is that there's a lot of different people that happen in this person's life. And some of them had a French accent, some of them were a German accent. And he's really identifying, you know, things to think about as I go through the production to make sure that that I'm aware of the things that need to be um, considered for the length of this project, which will be, you know, give or take around 10 hours long. So, so you got to, you, as long as you have good dialogue with the rights holder, you do um, have an ability to try to stem any problems that might happen later. Step seven, work with other studio professionals. Um, this is great. Um, joining Facebook groups has really been good for me. Uh, there are a lot of narrator groups out there that uh, offer a significant amount of support and advice. I don't comment on them a lot, but uh, you know, I listen and I read and I try to pay attention to the threads that are being discussed and, and what kind of things are available that maybe new people are, are coming into the business and they've got a question I didn't think of. And then I see some of the experienced narrators that are giving their feedback. It's been very good. So Facebook does have a lot of groups that are uh, able for you to, to join into. And I, I think it does provide a lot of good uh, industry knowledge uh, about how to, to improve just by reading and, and paying attention to what's going on around you. <clears throat> Start recording. You know, as we mentioned, your first 15 minute checkpoint is going to be the ability for the rights holder to give that first approval. And so you want to make sure that that is a ready project. My technique on the first 15 minutes is I will start it as if this were the first 15 minutes that you're listening to the book. So it includes the opening sequence, which is the title of the book written by narrated by then if there's something, uh, you know, uh, before chapter one starts that they want recorded, go ahead and do that. And then chapter one, and then if chapter one ends at like, 10 or 11 minutes, I'll probably record chapter two also. Even if it goes to like the 21 or 22 minute mark, I'd rather give them more opportunity, you know, give or take the 15 minutes than, than short it to 10. You know, I, I'm usually over, you know, 17 to 21 minutes is usually where I think my last few projects have gone. But, uh, but you, you do want to make sure that whatever you send them, that they can hear it as this is what the final book will sound like. So it's all mastered, it's all ready, it passes all the checks, and then here you go. Gives them a good uh, confidence level that you're going to finish with a, a good product. Once you finish it, then uh, you can do a couple of different things. Um, there's a uh, debate, I would say. Some people like to upload chapter by chapter. Some people like to wait until the end and upload every chapter at the same time at the end. Um, I have not found any issues with uploading chapter by chapter. Um, in fact, I have had a couple of rights holders express to me their appreciation. Uh, they could follow along with the progress and they enjoyed it. And so that's been good. Um, the, the flip side to that is you might have a rights holder that will listen along the way and then start injecting criticism or critique into the project, which that's what the first 15 minutes was for. So after that, it's no longer about interjecting a lot of things into your performance, they should be, um, you know, some substantive errors, you know, no, this, this was actually, this was the wrong person, you know, or that's not the way that this town is, is, uh, you know, uh, pronounced. So if there are things like that, then yes, I would want to know that, but you know, anything after the first 15 minutes is, is kind of hands off on the characterization and the production side. Step nine, yeah, now it's time to get paid. So if you're on a per finished hour, then this is going to be where um, you get the, the, the payment from the rights holder, and then you have to verify with the system that you've been paid. If it's royalty share only, as soon as they, as the rights holder, um, certify with ACX that they are good and there's no more changes required, then it just goes off for final QC to Audible, and then it shows up on online, and then you get paid by sale um, in your royalties at the end of, of uh, the month and then come back for more. Right. So keep, keep, uh, doing your work, keep, uh, 
trying your best to, to land auditions and get more work as they go. Um, you, you have a couple of uh, different um, levels of audiobook narrator. One of them you're in with everybody else. And then once you have 25 audiobook credits um, that are on Audible or through ACX uh, that are on Audible, then you can get uh, looked at uh, to certify as an Audible approved producer. And that moves you to a different category of narrator on ACX. And so some rights holders will select, I only want audio or Audible approved producers. And that really minimizes the pool that they have to choose from but they know that they're going to be getting a theoretically a higher quality narrator in the beginning. So you do want to, you know, I'm, I'm getting close to that. And I hope that, uh, you know, that comes up by the end of this year, that would be awesome. So, uh, it, but it does require to, to show that you can do this for a longer period of time. And that's, that's, will give you that extra, um, extra certification with ACX. So once you have it done, this is just a little quick snapshot of, of my profile there on ACX, uh, you'll see that my bio is only two lines long. Uh, I had it much longer for the first year. And then I read that um, people aren't gonna read the whole thing if it's super long. So I may as well cut to the chase. And well, brevity makes sense. And so I, I really shrunk it down to what do I want them to know about me? And what would I give the rights holder um, as a very quick snapshot to say that this, these are my skill sets and this is what I can do. But it also uh, gives you the ability to Id identify how you get paid, like what kind of projects will you take? And you can see for me, I'm fairly open on, on what I do. Uh, royalty share is available. Royalty share plus is available. But my per finished hour rate is two to $400 PF PFH. And you'll be able to select uh, where you want to start on that. Uh, very briefly, I'll tell you that there are a lot of projects out there that are in the $50 per finished hour rate. Um, even the $100 per finished hour rate, um, you know, is, is challenging for me to even take a look at. Because if you don't have the money to pay for narration, uh, may as well start with royalty share in the first place. But what happens with the low per finished hour is it starts to build a theory that narrators um, really can be bought for 50 bucks an hour. Well, if you start looking at what is your time worth, what is the, the union rate? So if you go and you hire someone who is actually SAG-AFTRA, what does, what does that require? Uh, narrators that are working for publishing houses, you know, um, the, the per finished hour rate is at $250 per finished hour as a, as a minimum. So, when I started my first contract, um, I thought I was really shooting the moon and I said 200 to, to start off for per finished hour. Um, I didn't get a few takers in the beginning, uh, but the first per finished hour project I landed was at the 200 per finished hour. And I wouldn't say that it was, you know, my best work. Uh, it was one that I, I was comfortable in. Uh, I still enjoy it. I enjoy, you know, listening to it uh, now and again, but it was one where I think that it said that I value my time and I value the work that I'm putting into this. And I know that I'm going to produce a good product. And this is, this is what you're going to get. And I think that that's very valuable. Your time is important and what you're getting paid is important. You're putting in a lot of work, whether it's the, you know, just the recording side and you're farming it out. And if you are, then part of that 200 per finished hour is going to go to pay the person that you're having to do edit, master proofing, et cetera. Or you do it all yourself, which means now you're four people in one. So you're not, the $200 per finished hour is for the finished product. So think of all the work that it takes you to do that. And now remember that I said per finished hour. So all of the work that you do, if it's six hours to get one finished hour, now that 200 PFH is for six hours of your work, right? So think, think about how that works out and then realize that that's why it sounds high. But when you think about what it, what it covers and what you got paid to do, um, I wouldn't go any less than 200 when it comes to, to doing finished work. So that, that all by itself says, make sure that you're ready to perform at that level. I see a lot of people say, well, I'm new and I don't really know a lot about what I'm doing, but uh, I put a couple auditions out the other day and we'll see what happens. You know, it kind of makes me cringe a little bit um, because I think if you're putting your audition out there, that means that you're ready to go. So 
the reason I put step seven in here about read and record and edit and master and get a finished product so that you can determine, are you at that level that you can do a finished product and you can make it the best it can be so that the, the rights holder is confident that you're going to be doing justice to that work. Then you put out there for the rate at two to 400 a finished hour at the beginning. Right now, my rate is at 300. And that's what I, I uh, regularly charge uh, at this point for per finished hour work. And my last seven projects have been at the 300 per finished hour. So, so it's it, as you grow and professionalize in the business, you can start moving up, you know, your hourly rate. Um, but as you see on my profile, that doesn't mean that I don't accept royalty share or royalty share plus anymore. You know, it, it's definitely, uh, if the project speaks to me, if it's something I really like and I, I really want to audition for and do, I will do that. You know, it, it's the quality of the work and the quality of the project. So make sure that you're researching the author, um, you know, look at the work, uh, make sure that it, it uh, is going to be one that you're proud to have on your resume and, and have on your profile and then audition and do it. All right, before we do that part, any uh, questions on the ACX or profile building auditioning to this point? I know that was a, a lot. That was kind of a marathon there in the middle. There's only one more to go. Okay, nothing heard. So it's a business. You are an independent contractor. So you're not an employee of Audible. You're not an employee of, of ACX or of Amazon or any of that stuff. You're an independent contractor. So as you do your work, um, you're going to need to look at, at what you're getting paid. I, I look at this as profits and losses. Uh, I wanted to keep track of everything. And because I also have a sole proprietorship because of the audio drama business that I do, uh, as you see the P&Ls for 2021, 22, and 23, they're uh, much more detailed because I started doing retail sales and things like that uh, with the audio drama side. But for the purposes of narration, uh, which is all I had in 2020, you know, it was about how much did I make for work that I did versus how much uh, did I spend to get going in the business. And I have a few things that were additive afterward, like domain name registration and, and some uh, uh, other software for an audio converter and things like that. But expenses and, and profits for year one, you know, not, not too shabby, but it's, it's what you want to try to to understand that keep track of what you spend and keep track of uh, what you do. I left that note on there to, to show you because I wrote this and I, I was unaware that um, parts of, of, a, uh, of a five minute block count. So look at what it is per finished hour and what is it by the minute. So um, I undercharged by $4 you know, on that. And I wrote to myself, lesson learned. So ACX will do the calculations. It'll tell you exactly how much you should get paid if you're on a per finished hour contract for that work. When it's all done and you've clicked, I done, uh, I'm done. Uh, it'll tell you to certify that you were paid this amount by the rights holder if you're on a per finished hour contract. So you don't have to do any math in your head. The system will tell you. And so I try to do math in my head and I should already know that because of my math skills in the first place to not do that. So I should have just gone with the system. It'll tell you exactly what you need to charge. All right. Um, so hopefully that was a little bit of what you need before you read. Um, uh, as a quick summary, um, I really enjoy doing this. Um, the, every piece of this business has taught me something else. I find that I'm a better communicator just by having to go through a lot of the preparation and the work that I need to do in audiobook narration, I'm able to um, use that in everything from voice acting to other audio drama productions to um, podcasts uh, to just general communication uh, at work. So there's a lot to to you know benefit from this business. Um, it's also a great way to to you know exercise those acting chops and to try to continue to perform and do it do something that brings you joy that that um, you you want to try to make into a small or a part-time business, or maybe move it to a full-time market later on. Um, have a thick skin. Sometimes the reviews don't come in well. And uh, we've had some uh, come through that have been, uh, I think one of the comments was, uh, um, 
you know, Jason Markiewicz's um, audiobook narration, you know, really feel the character with everything that that is going on. And, you know, he, he's really involved in the production and everything is great. And then I've also had those other ones that are like, I lost track of the story halfway through, don't recommend, right? So, and and both of those comments are in the exact same book. So by the by the individual reviewer, you get what you get. Um, but don't don't think that all of a sudden, because you got a, a lower review or you got something else that all of a sudden that means, okay, maybe I'm not right for this, so I'm just going to quit. You know, don't don't think that. Uh, move on. In fact, uh, I've heard a lot of narrators that don't even go back and read the reviews. Once the project is done, they're on to the next project. Forget it. If the reviews come in, so be it. Um, I like to go back and see every so often, you know, and just uh, see how things are going. But uh, I know there, there is certainly some goodness in allowing the reviewers to say what they need to say, and you move on to the next project because your business is narrating audiobooks, not necessarily going back and critiquing those who critiqued you. So think about that. Um, you are starting at the beginning, so it's going to take a while before you can really start demanding higher pay or looking into um, you know, other aspects of audiobook narration, pay your dues, but always prepare to succeed. This is a business that you can do as much or as little as you want to, depending on however much time you have to dedicate to it. So practice, but have fun. I've enjoyed it the, for three years and have no intention of, of doing anything other than, than this uh, for as long as I can handle doing it. So I hope this was uh, informative for everybody. Hope it gives you a good baseline to move forward. Uh, I'm open now for any questions you might have uh, before we call it a day on the, the presentation. So open for questions. Um, yeah, I had, I don't know if somebody else wants to go, if I- No, oh, go ahead, Patricia. Like um, do you have any experience with um, Autumn, which is, you know, the, the they use um, like uh, New York Times and Atlantic use it to read articles? I don't, I can't figure out if it's like a, um, machine generated or if it's are people hired to read the articles yeah i i don't i don't have any experience with that i know that there is a uh, flirtation with ai narration going on right now um it's very frustrating you know personally um you can get a computer to read stuff to you and that's fine but you need a human to put emotion into things and and you need yeah. you know a human to build the characters you know that that are meaningful and ai isn't going to do that um you know, I'm not, I'm not 100% anti AI and everything, you know, but uh, I, I don't think for the purposes of the narration business and anything related to, to audio books or, or audio dramas or things, I don't think there's a lot of value in it. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that, that may be an AI thing for the, the articles, I, I just don't know. But yeah. uh, unfortunately, there are companies that do audio books that are also looking at doing AI. And I just, I think that's, that's not good. Yeah, right. Um, and then I just had one little sure. technical question. Um, yeah. So in, I do have a ACX, what was it? Not ACX. Um, the Amazon other type account? of mic. Yeah, the um, the other type of microphone that you were <laughs> recommending. Oh, the the XLR the, mic. Yeah. XLR, yeah. So right. I don't, it doesn't plug directly into my laptop if I wanted to record no. on my laptop. It does not. Okay. And it's... Is it advisable to not use a conversion cable? Like, because it looks like the cables convert to USB. So I'm wondering if. Well, if, I mean, you can certainly try it and do it that way. But I know that the, the best way to use the XLR mic is to go through an interface. And most XLR mics don't have uh, their own power source. So they're kind of a receive only. And if you plug the XLR cable into, you know, phantom power kit, and then that goes into an interface. The interface goes into your computer. Uh, that's that's the, the the most simple way to use the XLR microphone. Uh, yeah. There are other ways you can put them onto a soundboard and a variety of other things to do audio leveling and all that other stuff. Um, but that's kind of you know more advanced you know work on that. I don't I don't do that anyway. You know I do the microphone to the phantom power to the interface to the computer, and okay. and so my interface is uh, the focus focus right Scarlett um, ser series. It's a four I four, you know, is the one I have. Um, and then the phantom power kit is just a generic, um, you know, two XLR cable, um, phantom power kit, which you don't need to, I do it because of audio dramas and having multiple mics set up. And so I have that, but, um, but anyway, going from the, the XLR, uh, to the phantom power, to the interface of the computer is your, 
your best way to get going. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question for you, Jason. Yeah, please. When it comes to uh, the mastering work and you talked about noise reduction, yeah. how much effort do you put into removing breathing noise? That's a great question. Um, and <laughs> this is a very recent change. Um, and I, I think a few years ago, and I've even noticed it in some of the older audiobooks that I've listened to, the breathing is non-existent and they've been taken out. But I think the, the more recent uh, belief is that people breathe. And if your breaths are disruptive, meaning they're very sharp, um, very loud, you want to practice more about breathing techniques instead of going through and just getting rid of them all because people breathe. And so the, the listener will hear you as a person breathing while you're doing the narration. And then all of a sudden there isn't breathing. It sounds more robotic. And so they, they, there's a, I guess it's more of a uh, bringing of the human uh, element to it. People breathe, they expect to hear it. Um, and so really it's, it's about how, how you work your breathing skills and, and how sharp or, or distracting the breaths are, uh, whether or not you need to try to minimize that. Uh, there are plugins that will be for breathing uh, reduction. And I, I know that uh, uh, there's a different, uh, different suite that, a software suite that really has some unique plugins for it. Uh, I don't, I don't do any of that. So it, it's not something that I've, I'm really familiar with, but uh, I know if I hear breaths that are really distracting in there, I'll just use that kind of like, if I misstated a word and I'll just redo that, that sentence or something and say, Ooh, that was terrible. Just try to redo it. I like it to sound natural. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? All right, great. Well, I, I hope that this was uh, informative and good for, for everybody to kind of answer some of the questions uh, that you initially answered when registering for this class and hope that you have set yourself up now to uh, take the next step forward in audiobook narration. Um, if you are interested in any individual sessions or anything to work with characterization, narrated, narration skills, um, a, a more in-depth on Audacity or working with ACX or any of those things, please let me know. Uh, send me an email or uh, all my contact information is right here on this final slide. Then you can certainly uh, reach out to me at any time and I'd love to help you get where you want to be on your narration journey. So I will stop the recording now, uh, but I will stay around for anybody if they have any individual questions afterward. Thank you so much for spending the time with me tonight and uh, good luck as an audiobook narrator.